Genesis chapter 7. You might recognize this reading as the one we did last week. All right, I didn't make a mistake. It's on purpose. All right. So it's Genesis 7 from 17, but we're finishing on verse 1 of chapter 8. Thanks, Carol. Okay. Um, starting from verse 17. For 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. <coughs> the waters rose and covered the mountains to the depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. May the Lord bless this reading according to his holy word. Amen. Thank you, Carol. It's quite a reading, that. You know? There's poor old Noah bobbing around in the ark for all those days. So. But we'll see. We'll see what happened. Last week we looked at the first but God example that's mentioned in the Bible. Can you remember where it was? All right, I'm going home. <laughs> it was found in Noah, yes. And where in the Bible it was it? Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. Okay. And Carol read it again this morning. Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. There's Noah in the midst of this, the greatest storm that's ever happened and ever will be. This greatest storm, this flood and this devastation that, that is covering the world. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, we read, But God remembered Noah. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock were there, that were there with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. And then we looked at, do you remember? Do you remember we looked at six scriptures that spoke about storms? All right. Okay, you remember those. And, uh, and some of the reasons why, why the, we, for the storms and the, the outcomes of those storms that, that we have in our lives and why God allows them. But we also, in those six, six readings from scripture, we saw the but God moment as well. And then, you'll remember, last week we concentrated on those first two words of chapter 8, verse 1 of Genesis, but God. But today we're going to look at word number 2 and word number 3. God remembered. So not just but God, but God remembered. God remembered. And the, but God and God remembered, they go together like salt and pepper, like steak and chips and that sort of thing. They, they go together, but God remembered. And I just want you to think for a moment in your own life. Have you had times when it seems that maybe God has forgotten you? Or you, he's forgotten about the things that you're going through? That the tough times you're experiencing are carrying on a little longer than you anticipated. And then if you experience that, that God remembering you moment in those situations, when things just suddenly turned around, and you think, wow, God's remembered me. And if you have, do you look back now and see why God let you wait that little bit longer? That little bit longer than you thought was necessary, maybe? But these are perfectly natural human responses to, to this situation. But God has a purpose in all of this. He has a purpose in all these things. Sometimes in this, 
this me-centered age that we're in now, where everything is about me. You know, you look on Instagram and the TikTok and and Facebook and everything, and it's just people. You know, it's it's about me. The whole selfie story. It's about me and the things that I do and me getting glorification for myself. And sometimes in the, this me-centeredness, we we listen to the voices that give the impression that that God exists to make all things well within our lives. Now come to Christ, and you're gonna your life's going to be hunky dory. It's going to be perfectly fine. There's going to be nothing wrong. You now that He exists. For our pleasure, not that we exist for His pleasure. Now, this this sort of teaching is prevalent within the church today. That God is there for our pleasure. Now, this celebrity pastor culture that we're living in—it's it's there. It's all about you. It's not about God. It's about you having the best, you experiencing the best, you enjoying life. Not about you giving glory to God. But that's not the case. See, God has a purpose in His dealings with us. Now, after many days adrift in the ark, bobbing around on the waters, the wind and the waves, the, the we read that God remembered Noah. And you've got to admit that that is that is an odd phrase. That God remembered Noah. It's an odd phrase to use for the the Almighty, the All Knowing. The one who is there continually, the omniscient, the omnipotent God that there. But God remembered Noah. Had he forgotten about Noah? Had he forgotten about him? Was he so busy with other things that, oh, is that guy bobbing around on the water down there? I'd forgotten about him. Was that the case? Was he so busy that he'd forgotten? Is that what God remembered means? Obviously not. Obviously not. Because God remembered does not mean that he's forgotten because God doesn't forget anything. Apart from one thing which he, which he, he chooses not to remember, which we'll see a little later. So what does this mean, this God remembered Noah? What does it mean? Well, from a human point of view, Especially when we're going through a storm, it can seem like God has forgotten us. But he hasn't. You think about Noah and his family. There is there's the, this force of this flood. The rains are pouring down from the heavens. The earth is split open and water is gushing out from the, from the depths of the earth. Humanity is wiped out almost instantaneously because of the force of the, the, the quantity of this water. Yet, it still continues to rain for 40 days and for 40 nights. And the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. We don't have any, anything in Scripture that tells us that God was speaking to Noah during those days that he was bobbing around on the waters. And quite likely, Noah didn't know exactly how long he was going to be there in the ark. But uh, I'm sure it, for him, it felt like it was longer than needed be. Right? Because there he is cooped up with his family for a year in the ark with those animals and the noise and the smell. But God remembered Noah. But God remembered Noah. The fact is, is that often the, the but God and the God remembered moments take longer than we expected. Lord grant me patience with God, I want it now. But he puts us through situations and teaches us patience. So in the end when we look back, oh well, Lord, thank you for those lessons through my life. See, it's not because of a lack of faith. You're not being treated strangely. It's a normal Christian living experience that's experienced by all the saints through time and through and by all of us as well. See, the patient waiting makes the but God moment all the better. If God just answered and did things straight away like that, how much reliance would we have on him? If we knew that, oh, if I asked it, it's going to happen. 
But through those times of testing, we wait, we're patient, we learn. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, we read that the Israelites had been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And if anyone has reason to believe that God had forgotten them, I think it was them. There are these people that have been called to be a nation on this earth, and there they are in slavery for 400 years. But God hadn't forgotten them. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, we read these words. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And they cried for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. That was a long wait for them. 400 years. And here we are, two and a half thousand years later, and we're still talking about their but God moment. Why? Because it was just so incredible. It was just so incredible. The, the length of their wait and the manner of their deliverance makes for an incredible but God moment. God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he spectacularly delivered them from the hands of Egypt. But God used that long wait for a purpose. Before the Lord could take Israel out of Egypt, he had to get that Egypt out of Israel. It took a long time. He actually had to bring the Israelites to a place where, where they wanted to go to the promised land. And despite the slavery in Egypt, they, they, had, good, they had food every day. They had shelter. They had clothing. They, they had a roof over their heads. But he had to bring them to a place where they wanted to go to the promised land. And it wasn't easy. It involved difficulty. It involved mistreatment by, by the different pharaohs of Egypt. And when the perfect time came, God heard. God remembered. God remembered the promises he'd made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, God can deliver at any stage. God can deliver at any stage. But we need to remember that he has a higher purpose and with a goal, not just to primarily um, take us out or rescue us from the trouble, but to develop his character within you as well. You've got to get rid of that old self. You've got to have the character of Christ within you. The people in the past knew that. And unfortunately, it's not taught much today. But praise God that he does hear our prayers. He does hear our prayers. He even hears our groans and he remembers in his perfect timing. There are two famous women in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and they, they share a lot of things in common. And they too had a God-remembered moment in their lives as well. These two women were both loved by their husbands. They were both in a marriage where their husband had another wife. They were both barren and desperately wanting children. They were both provoked and they cried out to God for many, many years. They both experienced a but God moment where God heard their cry and remembered them. And they both gave birth to a son who, in their own right, became legendary in the history of Israel. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1 and 2. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. That's her sister Leah. So she said to Jacob, Give me children or I will die. Jacob became angry with her and said, Am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? And despite being loved by Jacob, there was this fierce rivalry at home between Rachel and her sister Leah, who had many children. Rachel had none. She knew the promises that had been spoken by God as he had appeared to Abraham and Isaac and, and how he had told them that he was going to make a great nation out of them. And she knew that her husband uh, uh, Jacob had had the same encounter with God and the same promises had been said to him as well. And she thought, wow, this is, the, this is my chance to be the, the mother of a God-ordained special nation. 
My children are going to go down in history. But to be able to do that, I need a son. But despite her desire and her many prayers, it wasn't happening. She didn't even have one, a boy or a girl. And hence that verse, that those words in, in verse 1 where she shouts at Jacob, Give me children or I will die. The other woman, Hannah, she was in a similar position. She was loved by her husband Elkanah. But she was also barren. And what made the situation even worse was that Elkanah's other, other wife, Paneah, she was fruitful and she provoked uh, Hannah. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. These women crying out to God, Remember us, God, remember, remember. And then those God-remembered moments happened. Genesis 30, verse 22 to 24. Then God remembered Rachel. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and opened her womb. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. And she named him Joseph and said, May the Lord add to me another son. And then 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah lay with his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. And in both cases these, these women are barren. The scripture tells us that God remembered them. And what came of that? Well, for Rachel, the long waiting, the difficult times that she went through, meant that she gave birth to Jacob's greatest son, Joseph. And we know what happened with Joseph. And for Hannah, well, her difficulty in, in waiting led to a vow that she was going to give the child that, was, that she bore to God. As soon as she'd received this child, she was going to give the child back to God. And the result was probably one of the most godly judges and leaders of Israel, Samuel. Both these women had to wait amongst tears, they had to wait amongst the groans and, and the heartache that they felt, but God blessed them incredibly when the time was right, in his time. And there's another example of God remembering that's got some prophetic implications to it. One is from the first book of the Bible, we know in Genesis, and one is from the last book of the Bible, which is Revelation. And both are incredibly relevant for the day that we live in today. Back in Genesis chapter 19, verse 24, and then verse 27 to 29. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, towards all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. And he brought Lot out of the catastrophe, brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. And then in Revelation, Revelation chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. What a powerful earthquake. But God remembered Babylon the great, and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. God remembered Babylon the Great. So on the eve of, of God's judgment there at Sodom and Gomorrah, Scripture tells us that God remembered Abraham. He remembered his promise to him that he wouldn't destroy the wicked along with the righteous. And so before the judgment came deliverance. 
Lots and his family were rescued by the angels of God before the judgment came upon the city. And this is, this is so incredibly important for us today because it's one of many examples that shows that God's people, the righteous, are delivered before the wrath of God comes. God's people are delivered before the wrath of God comes. And it's going to be the same for the church of Jesus Christ in those last days. Before his judgment, Jesus, well, God's deliverance comes through the rapture. Before, pour, before God pours out his final judgment on the earth, we will be taken out. We will be there with him in glory. Jesus will remember his promise made to us, and he will be faithful to it and take us to be with him. But that's not the only thing that God will remember in these days. Revelation tells us that God remembers the wicked. He doesn't just leave them alone to their own devices. He remembers the wicked. And in the last days, Babylon, it's, a, it's synonymous with the world system and the evil that's around, will be remembered for God's judgment. See, we, we look around today and we see the evil that, that's around us. We see the, the wickedness and we think, well, how on earth are these people still getting away with it? When everybody else knows that what they're doing is wrong and evil and bad, and th these guys should be locked up. Why is it still happening? How long will it be before God judges? The answer is that no one gets away with anything. No one gets away with anything. No one will escape judgment. God has not forgotten. But he's incredibly patient, desiring that all people should come to repentance. But the day is coming when he will specifically remember this Babylon, Babylonian system this wickedness and, and evil that's around. And he's going to repay justly for all that has been done. And I think this should be a sobering thought for us. This should be a, a motivating action for the only safe place is in Christ Jesus. The only way to get out from the wrath of God is in Christ. For those who are in Christ, the cup with the wine of God's wrath has no effect. Because in him, we are perfectly safe. He is our high tower. He is our shelter in the storm. When we're in him, we're free from all judgment. But scripture also teaches, also teaches us that there's one thing that God forgets with the believer. But it's only with the believer. In fact, it's not something that he forgets, but it's something that he chooses not to remember. I think sometimes we forget, and then we remember the forget. But with God, he chooses not to remember. I am not going to remember that anymore. And what is that? That's our sin. That's our sin. Isaiah 43, verse 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and remembers your sins no more. And then in Hebrews, in the New Testament, Hebrews 8, verse 12, the writer says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. It's not that he, he blindly looks, looks over our sins. It's that he's, he's actually dealt with those sins at the cross. That he's forgiven those sins. That they are taken and that they are paid for by another. Micah chapter 7 verse 19 says, You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our, iniquit all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. If, how many of you uh, recall the, the dear old lady, Dutch lady from World War II, Corrie Ten Boom? She and her family saved a lot of Jewish folk during the war. And she says... God takes our sins, past, present, and future, and he dumps them in the sea, and he puts up a sign that says, no fishing. Okay? No fishing. That's what God does. He, he chooses not to remember. I'm not going to go back, and I'm not going to pull it out and remind you of what you did. So God remembers. 
He remembers His promises. He remembers to deliver. He remembers His own. But all in His time, for His ways and His purposes. So what about our response? God will remember you. He won't. He, do, he doesn't forget. The problem is, a lot of the time, we don't remember Him. It's so easy to go into the world and just get caught up and forget about God. Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. Psalm 105, verse 5. Remember his wonders. He, the, remember his wonders he has done. His miracles and the judgments he pronounced. Yeah? Remember his wonders, the things that he's done. But don't be like the Egyptians, as Psalm 106, verse 7 says. When our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses. And they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. But the one wonderful thing for us to remember is what Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 19. Where he's there in that upper room the last time with his disciples. And he took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we do that every time we meet around the table. We remember the sacrifice that God has made for us through his son. Noah spent about a year in the ark. But when God remembered and God delivered him, did Noah forget the Lord? No, he didn't. Noah had a wonderful but God moment. And when we, we read in Genesis, the first thing Noah did when he stepped out of the ark, he ran around. No, he didn't. He had a picnic. No, he didn't. He made an altar. And he sacrificed to God in thanksgiving. The first thing he did. He made an offering to the Lord for his goodness. The Lord has remembered. The Lord remembers you. And that's what each of us should do as well. We should, we, we should look back and see what the Lord has done for us. Remember what the Lord has done for us. And be thankful. Like Noah, when he offered that sacrifice to the Lord in thankfulness and praise for remembering him, do you offer yourselves back to him for his purposes? See, God remembers you. But do you remember him? Amen. Heavenly Father, there are so many instances within your word where we've seen despite the hardship and the trials the tribulations that people have gone through you have remembered them that you've taken them from that situation and that you've put them upon the rock and lord we see in your word as well that you will remember us and take us out before that final judgment But Father, we have to confess, confess that there are just so many times that we forget you. That we don't remember you. In the day-to-day -day runnings of our, of our lives as we go about things and that we're so used to doing, we forget you. We start to rely on our own strength. We start to rely on our own wisdom. We get caught up with the world. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us through your Son and the indwelling Holy Spirit to never forget you. To never forget your mercies. To never forget your goodness. To never forget the righteousness that you've bestowed upon us through the cross. Help us, Father. Help us to remember you in all times and in all situations, no matter where we are, who we're with, or what we're doing. Because all we want to do is to bring glory and honor to you. 
Almighty Father. Amen.